Hello and welcome to another episode of Hobby Hammer. Another issue of Hobby Hammer, as we termed issue, it yeah. last time. Yeah, I'm joined today by Miles, co-hosting Hello. today. Um, Hello. You've actually just got back from an exciting trip, haven't you? I have, yeah. I've just come back from Montreal in, uh, sorry, Quebec in Montreal. Um, well, Quebec? Is that how you uh, pronounce it? Quebec, yes. I, I'm turned into a native. I've got there every year, uh, at least once. I feel like I'm turned into a native. Uh, oh, no, I can't say that. No, they taught me a couple of words, but I really can't can't say it here. But that's always um, the, the way. Like, you get taught the bad words first, the words that you can't yeah. repeat, and then you learn the actual language. Like how to order a beer and stuff like that. Yeah, I'm, tr- I'm trying to learn French as much as I'm, I'm able to. I know the, the, the naughty words, uh, but none of the, none of the useful stuff. <laughs> Yes, so I've just come back. I'm a little bit jet lagged. Uh, we were talking about uh, before the show. Like I'm a little bit out of sorts. I'm a little bit tired. Like I, I can't really think in straight lines. Like really low on motivation. So it's the perfect kind of energy you want to bring into something <laughs> like this, like a yeah, an well, online podcast issue, whatever we're doing. Yeah. So he's. We're not today going to be complaining relentlessly about releases. I know, However, that's another thing that's really ticked me off. Like, I've got nothing to complain about. Yeah, exactly. It's almost like we're taking the releases as they come and, like, complaining about only the relevant ones. So, shall we do new releases first and then we can get into your trip and how we're going on yes. with our hashtag hobby hammer commitments across the world? Sure. Is, is that... <laughs> hashtag. Oh, hashtag. hashtag. Oh, yeah. I, <clears throat> I'm not no, down on it. that. No. N- nobody does that. No, that's like a middle-aged white guy trying to do something with his fingers. Oh, right. No. Okay, let's swiftly move on. Yeah, so new releases this week have been two farms. We've got first that I've pulled up on screen because Miles doesn't actually see this deck as I'm doing, so I've got to use my descriptive powers to not only put everything. it into everyone's ear holes, but also Miles' eye holes. I can see it. I can see everything. <laughs> I know exactly what you're going to talk about. It's the Siege Breaker, right? The Siege Breaker, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One out of two, yes. One out of two. <laughs> so, yeah, we've got the Siege Breaker model from Forge World. It mm-hmm. is, well, it's Mark VI with a bit of a, a dick pelt made out of a steel dick mm-hmm. pelt, as yeah. I'll refer to it. I think it's a, it's a fairly good model. Yeah, it's fairly decent. I mean, it, it does the job for Siege Breaker, right? Guy with a massive hammer. Mark, uh, I know it's some consternation about Mark VI. Mm-hmm. Um, and the fact that he's in Mark VI. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, there's always that perception that Mark VI was like the stealth armor, um, which I know isn't strictly true. You look back at like 40 years worth of, of reading, and if you were there at the beginning, you know, but common perception, right? It, it, it isn't always ruled by logic. Um but yeah, it looks decent. The, 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 the face looks serviceable. I like the uh, like nostril, nostril uh, wire. Tube. He's feeding nostril tube. tube. But I don't feel like we see enough of that beyond Horus. Uh, I yeah. feel like that could become like a, a meta in and of itself. Um, it's done in uh, uh, um, Sons of Horus colors, so it's nice not seeing a yellow release. Uh, it would have been nicer maybe to see this in Iron Warriors colours, maybe, maybe nitpicking here. But I do like the deck board he has going on. I mean, having like this three-dimensional uh, yeah. uh, table he's dealing with, that, that's a, a really nice, cool detail. He's, we, so one of the things is we Iron Warriors already got the Pravian. So mm. I think just doing every tech dude as an mm. Iron Warriors one is... They probably wanted to veer away from that a little bit to show that other legions mm-hmm. can actually have tech dudes as well. Yeah. No. And I have read that a lot of their vehicles, large vehicles, are done in Sons of Horus colours anyway. So having him alongside it kind of makes sense. Yes. There we go then. Now the hammer mm-hmm. reminds me quite a lot of Galmaraz, actually. Mm-hmm. Like it weirdly, it's, it's a lot blockier than you see most Thunder Hammers. It's sort of Do more like Grim the... Do you remember the console they released? Oh God! On one of the first weekenders uh, f- uh, for the Badab Wars, it was a C. No, it was a um, guy with a shield, or like an Imperial yeah. eagle on him, Mark III. Arc. Yeah, it reminds me a little bit of that. The hammer. Ah. Uh, so, mm. yeah, he's 
so I didn't realise they got the inspiration from that. Now, the only thing I can say on the flip side, because it's, it's quite a good model, is a lot of the things that seem to be done here, you could have done... Do you know the special bits could be done with the, t- yep. the tank command sprue? And that was pointed out on mm-hmm. my, page- my Patreon by Dave. Mm. Yeah, it's the we've seen a little floaty table. Mm-hmm. And yes, it, it already exists. A lot of people... It, it, is this something you'd go out and purchase? Is this special enough for like a one-off purchase? Or would this be something you cobble together with existing kits? Me... I'd, I'll probably end up buying one because it's it's got the, that different arc, mark of armor. It's got it's only got standard feet though, so I, I don't know that puts me off slightly. The feet of the model aren't anything special, but <laughs> like it's, it's it's, I, I will probably end up buying it just to have a, another different like differentiation within there. Whether it's worthwhile, mm. I don't know. Oh, it's, a, it's nice to have. It's a yeah. decent model, serviceable enough, nothing wrong with it at all. All in all, solid release. Do you think we'll be much more excited about it when we see like someone do an incredible paint job on that? Do you think there's anything wrong with the paint job? Because it's something that's been no, no, pop- no. that pops up every now and then that I'm not excited about a model. And then like, yeah. oh, someone's done that in an incredible paint job. Like the Knights of the Realm on Foot that came up last time. Mm. When they were, I saw them painted and in the flesh. It was I mean, so I think different. There is that. Yeah, the horse heresy community is a very particular way of viewing miniatures and paint styles. Like it's all very uh, military style based, whereas this is done in a more of like a, a, a games workshop, uh, heavier metal style. I mean, uh, the, the, the paint job's phenomenal. I mean, looking at the metallic, uh, the, the shading they have on it, uh, it, it's crisp, it's clean, it shows the miniature, but it's. It sounds so elitist saying this, but it's not done in the Forge World style. It's not done in the Heresy style. So as soon as it gets out into the community, into the hands of Heresy painters, yeah, uh, you, you might be seeing different aspects of the miniature come, come to the fore. I mean, even looking at this, I'd quite like to see this maybe done as a Siege Breaker or uh, like it, with with uh, uh, like a with a shield or uh, like a sergeant for a unit. I think mm. there's there's a lot of versatility to this kit. Um, yeah, like you say, seeing it out in the wild is a very different thing to seeing the staged, managed photos. Yeah, I, uh, I think uh, it's, it's a bit weird, actually, do you know, like for... Because I don't think it's elitist to say that, because you've, as you said, it's a very good paint job. It's just in a different style. Mm. Mm-hmm. It's a bit weird, or they must have changed their marketing strategy because they must have been like a high-level decision. Do you know, like someone mm. has been like, yeah. we need to change how things are getting done within the mm-hmm. heresy. And not even as a like as a conspiracy theory or anything like that. It's just there must have been a decision to change over painting styles mm-hmm. because it does clash with what a lot of people expect. Well, when you think of like the Mark I Imperial Armour book, uh, How to Paint Forge World. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you had that opening uh, section where you had all different kinds of you had an airbrush, you had uh, a clear, uh, you know, the the uh, clear bottle from from Johnson's. You had Tamiya paints, you had Vallejo paints in there. Mm. You had all these different kinds of brands and materials. And, and why should Games Workshop market other people's products? Yeah. Whereas they they can market their products done in their style. So I completely get it from sort of like a boardroom level. Um, Surely, though, you could do a reasonable estimation of because the 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 Vallejo like having a wider paint range might give you access to more choice in individual color. But they've made specific paint ranges for all of their models. Surely, they're bashing out these Mm -hmm. base colors with an airbrush just because it's faster. And Mm -hmm. so that's that's in place there. The other military model style like paint job, surely you can do with acrylics. It will just be a bit harder, but heavy metal style painting takes so long anyway. Mm -hmm. It must, I'm I'm sure it must just be a different tack. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Just the conspiracy theorist in me would say like, if I, if I was in charge of this, why am I marketing other people's products? To hell with that. Mm. We've got our own paint range. We don't produce airbrushes. We don't produce, uh, even though they have a, a range of airbrush paints. Well, this is what I'm getting at. This is what I'm getting at. They, yeah. They've got the airbrush paints. So yeah. 
they could be marketing their airbrush paints, mm -hmm. there must be something more that they want to do it specifically in heavy metal. Maybe because it's becoming yeah. more of a of a like a base game or a a first string game, whatever you'd call it. Who knows? Who knows <laughs> how these people think? I certainly don't. But we're men on the internet. Let's endlessly speculate. <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh, okay. Um, so uh, one of the conversations that came up in Montreal was, uh, if you could have one conspiracy theory be true, what would it be? Um, so this this is some kind of like new world order kind of thing, mm. linked up with. Uh, uh, there were rat men fun. under known. Right now, <laughs> it turned in the rat men gay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, did you have a a, a particularly good answer for that, or? <laughs> uh, nothing I can repeat here. What's the next release? <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. I can say, yeah. So the next I one public. is Riders of the Dead by Dan Abnett. Now, this is actually a re-release that mm. I was. So it came up across the week, like what novels are really good for the old world. And I actually, mm -hmm. a, a day later after it had come up, was like, Riders of the Dead, how did I forget it? It spawned my entire Chaos Army being a Kurgan, like horse-mounted horde. And about an hour and a half later, Warhammer Community dropped this. as like, we're, we're re-releasing Riders of the Dead. And I was like, perfect. That, that's the conspiracy theory I wanted to be true and it already came true. Is that they're, they're wiretapping my phone calls and <laughs> were listening to what I wanted re-released. Now you've not read this, have you? No. Um, so I haven't read much in the way of uh, fancy fiction, Warhammer fantasy <sighs> fiction. Um, I've read the Dark Blade novels. I found those good because I was a Dark Elf fan. Uh, uh, so like narratively, I mean they're pretty predictable. Uh, but I, I'm not going to give like a harsh critique of this pulp fiction. You know, it, it's a mm. serviceable thing. It's, it is what it is, right? I was reading it for some of the details of how, uh, uh, like, a rider interacts with the cold one. I found that the inner political workings of Harganeth. It, it, so that sideways look at the the inner workings of the community, I, I really enjoyed. Um, I've read. Oh, I have. I, I did enjoy the Tyrion and Teclos novels by Will William King, Bill King. Mm -hmm. Loved those. Bill King it felt a like an expansion. Oh my god, yeah. It felt like an expansion of the blurbs, the short stories that you found in the old army books, just expanded into a full book. So there's something quite comfortable about reading that. But no, I haven't read Riders of the Dead. I haven't read uh, any of the Gotrek or Felix novels. Uh, Drakenfels, I haven't read. Yeah, any of that stuff. So uh, in typical Dan Abnett style, especially at the time, he had a propensity to have a really intriguing setup, amazing second to third act, but then a very abrupt fourth, we tie everything up. It's almost like, oh God, I, I, I've run out of room here. I need to tie everything up with a couple of couple of chapters. Would you feel like the pacing is similar in this yeah, book? I think you've absolutely nailed it with that one. Is mm -hmm. yeah. He's, so he's a he's got both a compelling setup. He's like a book about both Kislev and Chaos Step tribes, uh, like mm -hmm. interplaying the different cultures against each other. You have this setup of. Um, mm -hmm a young, two young Empire troops being sent to the north to fight the Chaos Invasion. Okay. And then they're weaving paths and interactions, like, spawning mm -hmm. forth from there. Um, okay. So it, it has this <laughs> full story that very quickly gets cut short. I don't want to spoil it too much, cause, but sure. this is sure. one of my yeah. favourite books I will read it. of Warhammer Fantasy. And I must have read it. Okay. When I first read it, I must have read it ten times that month. Like literally, because wow, I was I was on right. holiday, and uh -huh. I was I had a bunch of books with me, mm -hmm. and just was like, nope, <laughs> I'm just gonna Fred. keep reading this. 1984, no, come with a stranger, no, <laughs> at the airport. That was the strangest thing. You're there in like a W. H. Smith, and you want to pick up a bit of light reading, right? Mm. I'm coming across things like 1984. The Stranger, uh, what else was there? Uh, uh, like Slaughterhouse, uh, Five, um, uh, Catcher in the Rye. Like, who in their right mind would buy this as casual reading for a holiday? <laughs> like, God almighty. Give us something light and poppy. Um, give us Riders of the Dead. I, I, I was actually looking for uh, End in the Death 
They had to, I, I oh, wonder really? where they had sort of like one of the mass produced copies. Uh, and I did have a look because every now and again, Neil Gaiman, I see on his social media feed, it's like, oh, if you're here at Heathrow, have a look, see, see the signed book. So I, I, I did see whether they had. Um, <laughs> that was a uh, vain that, hope. No. That was a. Yeah, a vain, I wasn't lucky enough. Hope. I wasn't lucky enough. But no, I will read it on your recommendation. Uh, and knowing Abnett and sort of like his style, I, I will happily read it. But maybe we could do a book club about it. That would be cool. Yeah, uh, give me. A, I'm a slow reader. Give me a couple of months. Mm-hmm. I'll read it. Uh, and we, yeah, we'll do a, we'll do a mini review of it, or like a full ass review. I don't know. We'll we'll see what happens when we come to it. Both. It's worth both. Like not it's not even both. one of them. Not even just the full. Okay. Both of them. Um, okay. And we need. We probably then need to do a like fantasy recommendation segment. I'll I'll try and put a list together okay. for next week of so what weirdly, books. I can be recommend read. books outside of Warhammer fiction mm. that that I feel are much better. Well, uh, so for example, like an easy low hanging fruit, the Elric of Melanbone, the eternal champion series by, um, uh, Moorcock. Mm. So he's the guy who invented the chaos wheel. He, he right. drew that on the bar. Yeah. He, he like, he, he was at the bar randomly one night and he drew the chaos symbol. And this, this is the chaos the symbol for chaos. Yeah. Things like that, uh, orbiting fiction that have, uh, Games Workshop ripped off and brought into their IP, or are inspired by and brought into their yeah. IP. Uh, yeah, we, we, we can look at stuff like that. Yeah, so maybe if I, I get some novels from the fantasy <laughs> universe and then you... Because, Miles, you did literature at uni, didn't you, as well? <laughs> yeah, I did. So, I did a master's in there as well. Yeah. yeah, so the orbiting... I imagine you'll have much more to say about this sort of stuff than me. Uh, let's see. Yeah, well, he's, I'm, I'm just not building expectations from my side. Like, I'm just getting yeah. my excuses oh, yeah. in early. Uh, yeah, and shall we get on to your Quebec or Montreal? Which one did you go to? Quebec. Quebec, Quebec. yes. Oh, I think you said uh, Montreal so the, before. Ooh. The, the, uh, so They're not going to be happy. Quebec is in. Quebec is in Montreal. Oh, so yeah, right. we're, we're good there. No, um, <laughs> very particular. When I was there last, I know, I know, no, no. Sorry, no, sorry, everyone. Uh, believe me, I know. I did say like, oh, I'm going to Canada. I'm teaching Canadians. Like, no, 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 no. Quebecers, we are Quebecers. Go yes. on, tell me about it was your super trip. Super fun. Then. It was super, but I, okay. I have a bit of uh, a bit, it's just to preface all this stuff, completely unrelated to anything. But I have one of my small-minded fantasies is to travel somewhere. I don't know in the middle of Thailand, right? Anyway, in the, in the middle middle of nowhere, and I come across a game shop. And just on the underneath, I walk down and they have their shelves lined with old Warhammer stuff. <laughs> yeah. Because they could never sell it. I'm like, oh, we don't really want it. We don't really know how to do it. Like, we'll sell it, off, sell it off to your cost. I was like, oh, that's a bit expensive. Give me half of that off. Like, okay, we just want rid of it. That's, that's one of my fancies, to come across like this dragon's hoard. Mm. That kind of came true when I was in Quebec. Um, the, my host, Philippe, hello, Philippe, uh, he's a bit of a Warhammer nut. Uh, so much so that all the stuff you see behind me, yeah, my hobby credentials, um, he has all of these in multiples. So when I was there, he, he arrayed all this stuff before me, like a full dark elf army, full high elf army, just, just hordes of stuff. And he said, you know what? If you want to take any of it, go ahead. We'll we'll uh, negotiate a price. But really, I just want to get rid of it. I think, oh god, how much of this guy fit in my in my bag? So in here, I've been looking for this for the Chaos Project because I absolutely adore this miniature. Mm-hmm. I remember when this was first released, and you could use it in a Cult of Slanesh army for uh, yeah, yeah. the Dark Elves, uh, like the multiple breasted. Chaos Lord. The boob love, worm. Love, love. The boob, boob worm. worm. Love that set. Love that set. I have, I've been given like a full High Elves battalion. <laughs> uh, and within this, oh, come on you. There's, I mean, it's just stuff to the brim of old sculpts, like yeah. uh, the old uh, 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 dragon riders, just, just packed full of other stuff in here as well. Is the battalion uh, the, the, like the 50 pound box or is that I, they used to do? Like the army box, or is it like the the hundred and twenty five pound full army one? I think I think this is the fifty pound box because the hundred and twenty pound box is sort of like at that. Oh level. yeah, yeah, yeah. 
longer and thinner. Yeah, these are the two battalion ones. The old Archeon. Uh, I'm a bit of a sucker for the old packaging as well. So that's great to add to my collection. Archeon on horse. Uh, uh, Archeon is, on horse. That yeah. is my favourite Boy- model Games Workshop has ever produced. Me too. Me too. Yeah. And just, I remember the first time I saw that, um, we had an advanced copy of the uh, uh, Chaos Rulebook at Games Workshop Swansea. And they were showing it to customers before the time of internet and internet leaks. We were flicking through it, and that was on the inside cover. And I remember we had like a 10 minute discussion over how good that miniature was. Mm. Uh, but this is just like the tip of the iceberg, the stuff here. Um, so, sort of like I've got all blister packs, because I know there's a well, bit of a fetish the in the code. community. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, there's a bit of a fetish in the community for um, like inbox stuff. So I've got like the old Dark Riders, more more Dragon Riders. So I've come away with uh, like two new fantasy armies. So oh. eventually, down the road, this will become a Caladorian army, a High Elf Battalion. Uh, the Dark Elves will become one of the provinces. Haven't quite decided yet. Um, and these will be added to the Chaos army I'm currently collecting. So yes, nice. this I, I wanted to show off my stuff. Your, your increasing Just, collection. My increasing collection, yeah. And I always encourage students, um, we, we want to be artists first, right? I always hate it on hobby sections, people bragging about their purchases, because it's not hobby. <laughs> what you've just done. You're a, you're a consumer, <laughs> right? You don't want to be a consumer. Like, oh, look at all this, this rubbish that I've bought. Look, look at it in box, unpainted. Yeah. And I am doing exactly the same thing that I preach against. Yeah, I know, hypocrite. I know, I'm a, I'm a hypocrite through and through. But this is all my stuff. Look at it, be impressed, say nice things about it. Of course. Um, so at least once a year, we go out to Quebec, uh, to Abyss, uh, the store, like this beautiful store, has two floors, so like this huge basement place, a, a basement underneath. The top is just full of product, like beautifully laid out, full working kitchen, amazing poutine, um, so, so poutine is sort of like uh, our kind of uh, chips mm. with cheese curd on it and um, gravy. Right, and okay. the gravy melts the cheese and it all kind of binds together. And you think with the softness of the chip, you think, oh, that's going to be disgusting. It is amazing. It is amazing. Poutine. Oh, yeah, well, I was going to ask what, what, the, what the hell is poutine? Poutine. Right. Yeah, yeah it's, it, it's very much sort of like a, a Quebec delicacy. Uh, Clamato juice is another one. We'll get on to that. Um, but yes, the course. So we were being a little ambitious this time. We were running both our army classes at the same time. So army painting 101, painting mm-hmm. legions, and army painting 102, painting legends. So the 101 course concerns itself with airbrush usage, building up a volumetric highlight, putting color on top. It's more about the underlying processes you need to, 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 to master to paint armies with. Yeah. And then 102 evolves the skill. So we talk about how uh, to develop your brush control, uh, how to dry brush, how to uh, uh, layer, how to use glazes, where and when to use them, color selection. And we take you through sample exercises on power swords and skin. So that's that's the basis of both those courses, mastering fundamental skills and then pushing them on to the next level. Um, so I, I'm not sure whether you've got up on screen I'll, right I'll now. I'll pull them up now. So I pull up some of the images. Yeah. So I've got the Dreadnought and Terminator. Beautiful. So this was a bit of a success. Uh, this gentleman had never used an airbrush before. He's coming into this, uh, Ivan. Uh, thank you very much for turning up, Ivan, and, and producing such amazing Imperial Fists. He wanted something that was very desaturated, almost like a sand yellow in nature, because he he doesn't like very rich, uh, uh, like eye-catching, poppy yellow. He felt that's a little overplayed. So he wanted something a little bit more desaturated, a little bit more gritty, mm. toned down. Dare I say it, heresy-esque. So we worked on the scheme a little bit uh, to get him to the point where uh, we, we, we were all writing down the recipe by the end to, to use it in our own projects. Um, yeah, that is so from going from having the material, having the equipment, but having no idea to use it. Then in one weekend, learning how to use everything, paint rich, how to clean mm. the damn thing, learning about volumetric highlighting. 
uh, I was very, very happy with that. And I didn't take that course. Uh, the course structure is Little Legends, but that was Alex. He took the course ah. from, uh, he, yeah, he's got a new name now. Uh, it's not Crescent Edge. Crescent Edge. Oh, is it not? He's rebranded into Abnormal Miniatures. It's exactly the same site uh, that you watch. So if you're uh, like signed up to him or if you've uh, subscribed to him, uh, it, it's still the same website, mm. Abnormal Miniatures. Yeah, and he developed this gorgeous Alpha Legion scheme. Um, so for my own course, we were using the uh, uh, the the uh, like a, a, a miniature that I've had made uh, that is only available on the courses. Can't sell them, um, and we would never sell them because they, they can't be sold. Uh, but they were great practice pieces uh, for students to undertake things like flame power swords. Uh, how to do the the uh, uh, line glazing on either side, well, and learning more about the decision making process of light, like where light hits and how it develops across the miniature and how it develops texture. Well, let me just it. pull up uh, one of the miniatures. Helipopula. Right. Helipo Are we recording? <laughs> yes. So I've just pulled up the. Um, Was it the Axamand model? No, no, it's not an actual model. No, no, no. <laughs> but I said that I am not affiliated with this model no, or no, Miles, or miles not, in any way. It's not based on any anything at all. It's just something completely unique that we dreamed of completely in isolation of anything else. Yes. No, it's, it's a not space based on anything. Night. It's it's it you know, it's there. Um so that, that, that's what we painted over the weekend. It was about uh, learning about uh, how to render texture and uh, in appreciation with a light source and just giving you uh, the, the underlying foundational knowledge to make better decisions in your miniature painting and do things like giving you sample recipes for black skin, Asian skin, uh, all different kinds of skin tones, uh, that, that sort of thing. So that, that was Army Painting 101 and 102. Okay. All the students had a great time or at least if they didn't, they haven't said anything to my face. So I'm going to take that as a, a win and take that as a victory. <laughs> and... We have a Hobby Hammer exclusive. Yeah, the next course will be running in Canada. We're still finalizing the time for it. So normally in around August time, we run a Beyond the Painting, uh, which is more of like a bus-led fine arts kind of thing. But mm. we're going to scrap that due to the, um, the amount of requests we had for this next course. We're doing a character sculpting and learning how to use green stuff course in August. Tickets will be available in the Legend Studio come uh, March. Again, we're finalizing the times for as soon as we know the times, we will give tickets uh, out to previous students first. Anything left over will be put out to the general public. We are for, from gauging from the response of students, this will be a very popular course. If you can make it, please make sure to reserve your tickets nice and early. But, okay, that's enough of the foremost uh, <laughs> uh, uh, salesmanship pitch from me. S -s sorry, sir. I, just, I know it's going to be a very popular course. Yes, come August, let's, let's create some characters. Let's learn how to use green stuff, how to manipulate it, how to create your custom stuff. Right. Um, yes. Now, the next little segment is, and this is going to be a, a large block of talking by Miles, because... I, I've got some questions I actually want to ask you about painting at the end for my old oh, world good. stuff. Um, okay. So I thought if, if we sort of do your Chaos Warriors that you've been working on mm. first, then there can be like some painting tips included at the end. Yeah, absolutely. Rather than sort of like running down back and forth in the news. So Chaos, Chaos Warriors, what I've been doing so far, um, it's rather basic. I want to get the red right. I'm going off the classic red recipe from uh, the realms of Chaos Book and like fourth edition, where everything was done in red. Mm. Uh, so for this, uh, I think I've got my base mixture. Uh, so it, it, this color actually won a bright orange by okay. MIG. So that's the basis and I'm modulating everything around that. Uh, so I want that really bright orangey-ish appearance, but with a bit of depth. Uh, so I've put the base coats down on them. Uh, I've put the underpainting sections to them. I'll be working on the black next. Refine them, adding some chips in the armor and all that kind of thing. But right now, 
is testing out the red, getting that red recipe down. I'm happy with it. I'm still on track to get these done by the end of the month, as well as the wolves, the skin wolves I'm doing. Uh, so at the moment, there's really not much to uh, comment on. It's progressing. It's progressing well. Uh, I just I I need to make that final push now to get them done by the end of the month, and I think what my next month's pledge will be. Yeah, so that's for our hashtag hobby hammer that mm. everyone can join in on. If when we get entries or when we get to the end of the month, we'll be selecting entries from Instagram as well as Miles's uh, Discord. Mm-hmm. And yet, so we five hundred points by the end of the month. Mm-hmm. Now. Is that honestly all you want to say about your pledge, Miles? Uh, r- really, for now, it's uh, I'm in the sort of like middle. I'm wading through the middle section of it. Uh, mm. I've got my red down. I'm happy with that. I'll progress onto the black. I feel like I'd be able to give a much more of a a uh, fuller commentary of it at the end of the month. No, right now I'm in I'm in the process of figuring stuff out. Yeah, that's so. N- <laughs> I guess right now I got the red done. Beyond that, no comment. Are the other and the, so these like new style chaos warriors, like slaves to darkness chaos warriors. Yes, these are the ones that you've are, been yeah. working on. Is is all of that other colouring on there just overspray? So um, to build them up, uh, I use a technique called underpainting. Mm-hmm. Uh, so underpainting is trying to see the scene beyond the miniature. So uh, when portraiture painters uh, 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 do a scene, they often block out like the mountains first and the sky. They build ambient tones in first. And mm-hmm. then they'll start building the characters, so the skin might be affected by the the, the drizzle of, of, of the sky, or like the the the, the burning sand underneath them, um, the the sea which they next do that kind of thing. So what I've done with these is try and introduce elements of the basing and the scene onto the miniature initially. So I take a big dry brush, I whack a load of uh, green blue on there. Um, it could be like coal black or marine blue I've used for this from the MIG ammo range. And then I've added purple, on, uh, sorry, magenta on top. Mm-hmm. And I've just slapped paint on either direction. And then I'll, I dry brushed over the top of it to give me a, sen- so, uh, a sense of value. So that's scaling from black to white. Uh, almost as a uh, pre-shade. You know like mm-hmm. how you pre-shade with an airbrush, but I've done that with a dry brush instead. Because part of the challenge for this project is I want to use the brush as much as humanly possible, as much as I can, to do everything. And then over the top of this, I start building the tones. So all the weird magentas and greens and blues that you could kind of see on the cloak or in bits and pieces, that will inform the non-metallic metal I do later. And it will help tie everything together visually. So the basing, the miniatures. Uh, if if I uh, the, the wolves, for example, they are tied together in the same way. It gives me an underlying baseline color scheme to build everything on top of. Right. Okay, a little bit a little bit of a plug here. If you did want to learn more about the technique, there's a PDF. Sorry, sorry, there's a PDF and there's a, a full video on this demonstrated on one of the Zangors from Silver Tower available mm. on the Patreon right now. So if you did want to see this technique in action, and of course I'm filming all of this as well, and when the materials are ready, I'll pop that up online as well. But that's the underlying thinking process I'm going through, creating the baseline tone that mirrors the ambience of mm. the piece uh, uh, of the world and then working up from there. Yeah. Um, actually, I might check that out myself, really, because it ties, <laughs> okay. into, it ties into slightly the question that I'm going to ask you. So I've been working on my Bretonian peasants all month. And so I've got my men at arms sort of halfway through, like sort of a base coaty stage. I've done a pre-shade on everything beforehand just I wanted to build up some sort of like I'd been looking at uh, oil painting techniques because mm-hmm. I wanted to, I mm-hmm. also wanted to do as much as possible with a brush mm-hmm. so I'd actually been speaking to some of my friends that were doing art courses and they're like oh well no even if it doesn't get used later because I was worried about just my effort getting wasted doing the pre-shade okay and they're like oh no just put it on and it's it, even if it's subtly it's never considered wasted it's just part of the mm-hmm. technique. Um, so I got onto my Bretonian. <laughs> I got onto my Bretonian Bowman, and mm-hmm. spent far too long actually. And this is general commentary on the the process. Got spent far too long on them because I ended up blending the bows 
and the oh, horn no. of the musician <laughs> just to oh. get like a nice U sort of colouring across them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> that was like two days' work to do 10 Peasant Bowmen to about half done. Mm-hmm. And they're five points a model. So it probably wasn't the best yeah. use of my <laughs> two days. No. <laughs> so one of the things that I'm going to be running into with this project is in wanting to brush paint these peasants, because they'll have lots of random sort of clothing mm. colours on them. Actually, I'll, I'll pull it off. One sec. So I've got, I've printed out this. This is the Victrix painting mm-hmm. of some Saxons. I should have, mm-hmm. I might dub that in later over the top so it's just very random sort of colour scheme for the dark, some dark age dudes mm-hmm. if I I need to be using consistent colours across the army so with doing half of them with brush painting mm-hmm. I then want some more vibrant schemes for my knights which then thought oh I'll use the, the pre-shading more maybe use an mm-hmm. airbrush now mm-hmm. To keep a unified scheme within that, would you do anything more than just using the same paint colour across? Because obviously then in the highlights, that's going to come across as a different colour to the low lights and then even where things have come in. Do you know, like, there's going to be different tones Um, within that colour? Really what we're looking at is sort of like two elements here, the peasants and the knights. Mm. Do you really want them unified? Well, that, I just don't that, want it to look first like question. disparate and just not like it. I don't want to put sure. it down and it'd be like, that's just mm-hmm. all over the place, you know? So, so so that's one of those questions, just kind of like have it percolating in the background. Um, so when I talked about appreciating uh, 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 um, the, the technique, the underpainting technique, you might want to consider putting a base layer of a brown across the entirety of them, sort of like a rhinox hide across mm. absolutely everything before you begin pre-shading. So I'm not sure whether you're doing a pre-shading with an airbrush or a dry brush, but whatever. Put everything with a base layer of brown. That way you're tying all the shadows together and you're, with something like this, with a project like this, you're grounding them. Mm-hmm. Because I find, you know, brown, mud, everything is grounded in, in, in the ground. <clears throat> then from there, you can suggest uh, subtle differences. So with the knights, for example, at the base pre-shade, you might want to take a magenta, and then uh, adding that to the brown and then putting that down as the pre-shade. So even though this shares similarities, the knights will automatically have a richer color palette from working from that base magenta. And then you could put a pre-shade over the top of that to define the volumes and the values of the piece. Uh, try and do as much of it with brush, sure, but don't feel like you're inhibiting yourself by not using your airbrush. I'm sure at certain mm. portions in this project, maybe when it comes to like the mud or unifying tones, I'll be using the airbrush as well. The intention is to use the brush as much as possible, but I'm not going to stymie myself with this artificial uh, constraint I'm giving myself. Um, looking at the Bowman, I, I think if you put the brown base and then the uh, highlight either with a brush or an airbrush, then you could break things up almost in a slap chop manner. How you put colors over the top to define light shadows, highlights. You mm-hmm. don't need to use contrast paint. You, you just simply don't. You can take regular paints and add thinner to them. So yeah. you can use uh, acrylic, acrylic thinner like you use for your airbrush. And you can even use things like flow medium that you can buy in big. Hold on. You can buy in big vats like this. Yeah. So you, you, you don't you don't need to buy like Lamian medium or the small. Go to your local art, art store and buy things like this, acrylic medium, flow improver, glaze medium, that kind of thing. Experiment with them. You can create your own version. So this this is my mixture gunk uh, that you can find online. It's on my old website, the, the um, recipe for it. And then when you add this to color, it preserves the intensity of the tone while still diluting it. Um, you know, I wonder whether I could give a small demonstrate. Whether I could give it. I, I know I promised I wouldn't do this, uh, <laughs> but if I re- reorient the screen, right there, you go. That's yeah. It's not too bad, right? No, that's cool. That's pretty centered in the for this impromptu okay. painting lesson. 
yes, sorry, yeah, yeah, I promised we wouldn't do this, but then we've ended up doing it. Okay, so I want the shield to be black. Um, let me put this over here. Okay, let's take uh, a one of these. Okay, I've got my gunk mixture in here. A little bit of gunk. Let's move and this all is my just hobby, basically hobby credentials. Like retarder and flow medium. Yeah, is retarder, this? flow medium, and boiled water. And boiled water, right? Boiled? Bo bo boiled water, so there's no impurities in it when you mix it together. Right, okay. So you go, hello. I'm not sure whether that picks up or not. Um, okay, so I'm going to take a little bit of... Uh, I want Black Templar. If people are familiar with this, great, they can use it. If not, you can just use regular black paint. Uh, what would you prefer to see? Regular black paint. Regular black paint. Okay, great. So on my palette... So I've hastily thrown together a new scene so that everyone can see what Miles is doing perfectly. <laughs> yes. So we have our gunk off in the corner. Let me see if I can put that on the screen as well. And we have just regular old black. Now, this black's been here for a couple of days. Uh, I think this is the Chimera black that I have. Okay, great. So if I use the water straight in the top, it's going to give us a fairly decent result. But the gunk will preserve the intensity of that. So from the initial <clears throat> dry brush of the piece, I can see there's a lighter layer up here, darker down here. Zoom in a little bit more. Okay, so what I'm aiming to do is drag that into the shadows. Okay. Yeah, and this is a, a fairly heavy layer as it's going on, at least by the looks at the start. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to slightly visually, or like, Sure. Giving audio description for anyone listening on audio only. Yeah. Oh, God, yes. Yeah, because we're putting that in audio only. Yes. So it, it's a fairly thin layer. We're looking at maybe like uh, one portion paint, maybe two portions thinner. But I've drained off excess on my brush to ensure that it doesn't pool in any areas. And so tip lead down here. You know, if I just left it like that, I'd have a fairly decent movement from light to shadow. But as it's drying, I'm going to take a little bit of pale green. Uh, I'll tell you the exact colour after this. I'll try and stipple it on top. When you say you tell us the exact colour, are you much bothered about that exact colour? Uh, what or, do you mean? Or is... Which colour? The light green? Yeah. Yeah, have you uh, so the, picked up the, the nearest the light, light green, green or... Uh, so the light green is actually the top color of the red as well. And that becomes my unifying tone. So every aspect of this miniature, the top highlight is going to be in USMC tank crew light green. And that will unify my tones together. Right. So this is where the specificness is coming in rather than yeah. that. That black was just what you had on your palette the other day. Yes. Mm -hmm. So this should be the one people are at the highlight stage are worrying about. So, because you've got the yeah. the underpainting that's unifying it, and now you've got the highlight that's unifying it, the the mid. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's it. That's my highlighting. That's my shading. That's my coloration. That's everything is done, mm. because you can see the violet coming through, the green coming through, uh, and then we have the top highlights in the uh, in the grey. That's it. Uh, I wonder whether there's something that's like more colourful we can deal with because you did mention yellow. And you did mention yeah, so um, uh, blue as well. Essentially, when I get to my knights, mm -hmm. um, and this is for everyone at home, if I have a knight that's, that's entirely yellow, mm -hmm. then I go on to the next knight and is mainly blue but wants yellow accents, I would then be thinking, how do I match those yellows across the knights? So even if it's just mm -hmm. between the knights, how do I unify this already riotous colour unit, a li mm. at least a little bit. Okay, yes. So using a unifying highlight, like a universal highlight. So um, I, I need to add in like another layer here so I can take a little bit of my... Oh, that's off screen. My highlight colour, add it to the green. 
drain it off. Then right at the apex of the highlight, I can add just a couple of these dots for here as well. Okay, so even though I'm dealing with uh, red here, mm -hmm. I'm using exactly the same color to highlight it as I did the black. When I come to do the boots, I'll use exactly the same to highlight. E everything on here will receive a small highlight of that color to bind everything together. Brilliant. But you, you, you need to know what your unifying tone is. So that was the painted demonstration for unifying tones and uh, adding color over a, a uh, underpainting. Again, if you did want to see more about this, check out Little Legend, uh, our Patreon. There's a dedicated video and PDF behind this. Uh, but Max, in regards to your question, uh, adding a unifying tone to the top highlight of everything will help immensely. But ultimately, I, I wouldn't worry too much about having slightly different yellows, slightly different blues across your collection. Because this is at a time where, where would a Bretonian lord or knight get his garments made? Would, would they go to the same store? Would they go to the same haberdasher? Would they use the same dyes and materials? There'll be slight variations at mm. base anyway. And what really ties a project together is things like weathering and basing. So if you have slight variations in the blue and the yellow, whatever, it's it's the basing that will tie things together more dramatically than, than anything else you can do. Yeah, no, that's I think I'd got wrapped up maybe too much in they're going to be so different colours because everything, mm. including mm. my the shields of my peasants, <clears throat> are all going to be mm -hmm. in, like individual. So mm. then I was like, well, at least while I'm doing that, the colours with it used within those variant um, schemes. So another... Just to go off on another tangent, uh, another way you can think of them is as a unit. Um, oh, sorry. Give me one sec. Don't worry, I'm not changing cameras or anything like that. Okay, another thing we could do is think of the unit in its entirety. So I've got this Little Legend Guide to Color Theory book coming to Kickstarter in March. <laughs> yeah. um, so um, it, it, in here, uh, it talks about harmonies. Um you can use, uh, so when you think of color schemes, you can use complementary, so colors that exist on opposite sides of the color wheel, split complements, so using two colors like this. So why not think of a tetard? So tetard is a rectangle within the space. Mm. So you can use yellow, orange, violet, and magenta. For oh, you're making this very hard. <laughs> oh no! Sorry. Yeah, just point to them again. <laughs> yes. So you can use. Uh, I mean, even using sort of like a split uh, uh, complement variation, sort of like putting a triangle, uh, a square within it. You can use uh, yellow, orange, green, purple, mm -hmm. and use combinations of those within the unit. So even though knights will be different colours, they'll all be uh, joined up together by this. Uh, the, the, the the choice of colour through the complements that you use. So that could be another method you use. Yeah, that might be the the one that actually solves it for me. Because it's been mm -hmm. I've really wanted the army to be the the classics of every knight is different. Mm -hmm. Um tying into my dark age or ed, early medieval theme. All the peasant mm -hmm. shields even are going to be different when normally they're quite unified in their lords yeah. colours. Mm -hmm. So it's been something that's on my mind with thinking, how do I then make it feel like an army rather mm -hmm. than a million yeah, that's, entirely that's, separate projects? Yeah, that's the way then. So jump online, have a look at harmonies. And I'd uh, either choose a tetard or a double split complement. Right. So try those. Yeah, try and that those. is why... I've asked Miles to do this, or like we decided to do this cast together because mm -hmm. I'm just trying to get as mine Miles of as much knowledge as possible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I want to see people's projects get done and over the line as well. And if this gives any kind of encouragement to people to actually paint their stuff, well, great. Uh, that's that's what yeah. I want. Well, I think it's one of the things the the Bretonian every color different army. Mm so many people bounce off including myself like years ago mm -hmm. 
that mm. I really want to see it through and it wants to be... And me and Miles have talked about this before, actually. My Iron Warriors don't display painting skill. It's very hard to get someone to look at an Iron Warriors army. Mm. They like they, From table length, it looks like mm-hmm. an, any other dry brush silver Iron Warriors army. Yeah. It, getting someone to there is really hard. So part mm-hmm. of selecting Bretonians was something that I wanted this army that drew people in so that they then had the desire to put close mm-hmm. to their face. To do that, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, think that's our hobby challenges. Mine is going, I've got pff, 50 points half painted. Miles has got significantly mm-hmm. more than that with his Chaos Warriors. It's <laughs> oh, a Chaos Warrior. Yeah, yeah it's, it's not something that, like we say in these hobby challenges, but actually if you don't finish your month because life gets in the way or you're just picking a an insane scheme that takes a long time we're not going to be on people's cases or anything like that we're not asking for people to make commitments before it's just something to encourage that we're all going through this new yeah. new it's, old it's world gen- grow. it's gentle encouragement for everyone and i mean we, we were talking about this like i'm sure my 10 guys character and uh five wolves doesn't equate to 500 points but it feels like a good starter for an army so i mean there's one guy on the challenge doing like a blood bowl collection mm. do whatever you feel is right for you with it and february such a short month anyway do whatever you feel is right for you in that month uh gentle encouragement the discord the discord group is great for that like i'm, I'm having so much fun tracking everyone's progress and keeping everyone like somewhat accountable to it uh so if you did want to join up completely free um descript- the the link will be in the description below Join in the fun. Yeah, so you'll have you've got to. If it's not Miles's fault, it's Miles's fault. He's been very helpful yeah. in the painting today. Um, but it, it's, it's, yeah. short, it's on your Instagram as well. I think it is. Like the, yeah, if you tag anything with Hobby Hammer, we'll review at the end of the month. Keep that ball rolling, Hobby Hammer. Trying to Hobby Hammer, trying to push that. Uh, yeah. But uh, you have an event, right? I saw this pop up on Facebook. Yes, so me and Phil from the Road to Reichland podcast, um, Mm -hmm. obviously from this channel time and time again as well, we've decided to run an old world event on the 8th and Mm -hmm. 9th of May. It's not May, it's not May, it's June, it's June, yeah. Okay, June, June, June yeah. I'll put this link in the description below to the event, right? And we're doing uh, Brewery Towns Burning, which is a homage to a... One of my favourite supplements ever, actually, for any game, like, and favourite fan-made supplement, certainly, but it's for Mordheim, called Border Towns Burning, where you take a, a caravan across the cafe and fight Chaos Warriors on the way. So I've actually already got finished, like, sort of 16, I think it is, um, <laughs> like, carts and wagons, so that we can stage a, a narrative, the old world event, where you take your wares across to cafe um, <laughs> as merchants. That's awesome. So yeah, it's, I'm, I'm hopefully going to acquire a Bugman's cart for the dwarfs to really tie wow. into that brewery theme. But yeah, it'd be five games across two days. We're going to do 17, 50 points that anyone that is amazing at maths may like extrapolate out from the hobby hammer challenge that that's actually the points level we get to and yeah so we're just running the 1750 points it's got to be fully painted um that includes the movement trays or fully painted and based including the movement trays um i need a narrative event rather than a dick kicking event so anyone that is unsure of getting into the old world um or into the event scene it will be a friendly style event rather than like a really wacky yes. one. Yeah, rather than fully optimised lists. Uh, and yeah, that's the event. I'm really looking... It's actually really looking forward to it, just running a something based on this storyline that I've loved for and ages. And where is it? Where's it being held? Oh, it's, it's it's around me, Miles. It's So it's in, it's in Manchester, in mm-hmm. the Vale in Mosley, it's called, which is a, a community centre that has ample parking and also a train station 10 minutes walk away oh there we go that's what i want to hear i'll see if i can make it up 
Uh, I'm pretty sure I'm in uh, uh, Australia around that time. But if the uh, if the stars align and mm-hmm. I have my stuff painted, I'll 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 have my first Chaos Warrior outing at the event. Yeah. Give it a whirl. Yeah, quality. And and yeah, I think oh, that sure. brings us to a wrap for today. Um, Miles, is there anything else to add from you? Yeah, could I just say, because uh, we haven't had much complaining on, on this episode, uh, there's a new limited release, uh, Art of Heresy, coming out this weekend. They don't learn their lesson. Why? I would have loved to have purchased that book, but I'm not going to even bother with the scalpers that exist out there. So yeah, cheers for that. Let's Let's end the show on a nice... <laughs> Note of negativity. <laughs> Excellent. And we'll catch you everyone. And we'll catch everyone next time. <laughs> In a bit. Bye bye.